What's up YouTube, how goes it? So more often than not, I find in my comment section, people are often debating amongst each other what the definition of a good display is. This goes for laptop displays, sometimes external monitors. And of course that beckons the question, as a general consumer, what are some things you should look out for when buying a display to see if it's ultimately a good display and whether or not it meets your particular needs. Now keep in mind, there are many technical aspects to determining whether or not a display is high in quality or not. We cannot possibly go through all of them without making this video at least an hour long. So I've kind of condensed it to points that I think are readily available and are general indicators for the general consumer of whether or not a display is high in quality or whether or not it's a good display overall. So as always, if you guys enjoy if you enjoyed this video, hit that like button, sub to my channel. I genuinely try my best to help you guys as general consumers find the best possible information. Let's get started. The first and most obvious element I want to talk about is screen size. Now, for example, in the case of a laptop, screen size usually vary between 12 inches all the way up to 17 inches, although they can be smaller or even larger, arguably. But keep in mind, screen size ultimately decides your field of view. It shouldn't be confused with how much you can see on the screen, but rather how much of a screen you actually see. So it's a more obvious factor. But also keep in mind, screen size has implications for other factors which I'm gonna talk about in the video. For example, the larger the screen, the more the image stretches. So if you buy a 24 inch monitor versus a 32 inch monitor, and they both have the same resolution, which we'll talk about in a minute, the 24 inch monitor is just gonna look more sharp and precise. Another aspect you'll frequently see mentioned on many retailer and manufacturer's website when buying an external monitor or laptop is the panel type. The three most common ones you'll hear, of course, include TN, VA, and IPS. Now, TN panels are the oldest technology and also usually the cheapest of the bunch. Most budget computers actually have TN panels. TN panels, aside from being cheap, do make some pretty dramatic compromises. For example, they're not as colorful as your VA and IPS counterparts. Also, you'll find that TN panels generally have poor viewing angles, meaning they're great if you're just looking straight at the screen, but the more you go away from the center of the screen, the more difficult the display becomes to look at. In contrast to this, an IPS panel is usually more expensive. It's a newer technology, but it has a considerable wider gamut of colors, meaning the screen can produce more unique colors, hence look more colorful and vivid. Also, IPS panels have much better viewing angles. And of course, somewhere in between there is a VA panel, which has better color ranges than a TN panel, traditionally speaking, but it also, of course, has better viewing angles than a TN panel, but not as good as IPS. Now, this is a gross oversimplification. There are other factors to consider with these panels, like response rate, for example, but I don't wanna go down that rabbit hole again. This is for a general consumer. If you are interested in a detailed video about panel types, let me know in the comment section below and we can video on that. Next up is probably the most popular term in terms of display marketing, resolution. This usually comes in popular terminologies like 1080p, 2K, 4K, and more recent times even 8K. What does this mean? Well, resolution in the simpler terms is just the amount of pixels horizontally versus vertically. So for example, a full HD display has 1,920 columns worth of pixels, and each column has 1,080 pixels. Hence the term often noticed as 1080p or full HD. A 4K display by contrast has 3,840 columns, and each column has 2,160 pixels, hence four times as many pixels. Now you may start guessing what's going on here. The more pixels you have on paper, the more crisp a image looks. So there's more pixels representing a given image. It's sharper, it's more concise. Now, on smaller screens, it's more difficult to notice this. For example, if you're buying a 12-inch laptop that has a option for a 4K display versus a 1080p, it's actually gonna be fairly difficult to tell the difference between the 4K screen and 1080p at first glance. It's possible, but more difficult. Versus on a 32-inch monitor, you can easily tell the difference between a 1080p screen and a 4K display because as the image stretches, you start losing pixel density, also measured in PPI or pixels per inch, and the lower the PPI, the more unclear or stretched out an image looks, and the higher the PPI, the more condensed and crisp and visually appealing an image can look. So rule of thumb here, if you're buying a larger display, consider getting a higher resolution. If you're buying a smaller display, the high resolution is not as important of a factor necessarily. Another area I'll really quickly touch on is aspect ratio. Simply put, this is the ratio between the width and the height of the display. The most common aspect ratio nowadays on monitors and laptop displays usually is 16 by nine. This is a very popular widescreen format. However, in recent times, we've seen a bold shift towards the new 16 by 10 aspect ratio 
which tends to be a little bit taller than your traditional 16 by nine aspect ratio. If you have the privilege or opportunity of going to your local electronics store and comparing two monitors side by side, I'd highly suggest you do so as the 16 by 10 often gives the perception of being a much larger screen, even though the physical difference is actually negligible. So again, I don't wanna say which one's right or wrong, but definitely try out different aspect ratios physically if you can. Ever notice how some screens just appear more fluid, smoother, and more consistent than others, particularly when showing something in motion? Well, that's often because they actually are. This usually takes form in the way of refresh rate. Simply put, this is the amount of times a image actually refreshes in a given second. The higher the refresh rate, of course, the more smooth a image will appear. So most displays nowadays come with a minimum refresh rate of 60 hertz, which is kind of the standard. But you'll notice that more higher end displays, particularly gaming monitors or gaming laptops, and of course, TVs that are higher end, have a refresh rate of at least 120 hertz or even higher than that. And this allows for a much smoother image. Now to the average Joe, who's just on Microsoft Excel, filling up a bunch of cells, he probably couldn't care less about the refresh rate, he just wants to see his cells populated. But for someone who's doing first person shooter gaming and they have a lot of motion going on, or you're playing a race car game, that refresh rate really adds a whole extra layer of smoothness. And this has become so popular that you start seeing it on phones as well. iPhone just recently introduced admittedly late, the ProMotion 120 hertz display. And once you get used to using this, a 60 hertz display feels choppy and almost like it's lagging. So refresh rate is a great or nice to have attribute for some people, but for people who again are in gaming or you watch a lot of sports or fast motion content, a high refresh rate arguably is often something you should give priority to. On that same note, ever notice how some displays look more colorful and vivid than others? Well, that's because again, they usually are. And one of the most common ways we measure color accuracy nowadays as an industry standard is the color gamut. So the more common terminologies around that include sRGB, Adobe RGB, and DCI-P3. Also, sometimes you'll hear the terminology NTSC rating. Now, all these usually come in the form of percentages. And a oversimplified way to look at it is the higher the percentage, the more color accurate a display looks. So for example, a screen that has a mirror rating of 50% sRGB versus a screen that has a 100% sRGB rating are gonna look worlds apart in terms of their color accuracy and vividness because 100% sRGB screen can actually produce a greater spectrum of possible colors, a greater spectrum of possible shades of orange, for example, versus a screen with a lesser rating. Now, generally speaking, if you are a creative professional who relies on photo editing, video editing, or any sort of color grading activity for their day-to-day -day job, you should not get a display less than 100% sRGB at a bare minimum. However, again, if you are doing color neutral stuff like writing up Word documents all day long, or you're on Excel, you may not care about about color accuracy as much. Although keep in mind, better color accuracy of course also means that when you're watching media like movies or content on YouTube, it'll look more colorful, more appeasing to the eyes as well. Now there are other factors when looking at color accuracy such as delta E variance and also the bit rate of colors, but I'm not gonna kinda get into that over here because again, it gets a little too technical and I'm trying to keep this consumer friendly for you guys. The final aspect I'm going to cover today is brightness levels. So let's be honest here, we've all had that moment where we've had the curtains open or the lights are on too bright and we have a hard time looking at our screen because of glare. Well, the more brighter your screen can get, the less likely you are to have that issue. In today's time, you should not consider any laptop screen, any external monitor, any display in general that has less than 300 nits of brightness level. This information is usually readily available on the manufacturer's website or the retailer's website. If not, a quick Google search will help you find it. I highly urge you to keep maximum brightness as a key consideration, no matter what kind of display you're going for, because ultimately it's going to make a huge difference in the quality of life life of the product you're getting. Now with that said, also keep in mind that for a display to be considered HDR officially, it needs to have a minimum of 400 nits of peak brightness level. So again, if you see anything less than that, it's not HDR, don't fall for that trap. So once again, I emphasize, do not get a display less than 300 nits of peak brightness. Ideally, you wanna get something higher than 400, but 300 is kind of the minimum cutoff. 
Now, I know there are a ton of other technical aspects to consider in buying a display, but like I said, I'm not gonna go in each and every one, as some of them may not be relevant to you whatsoever, but some of them are just far too technical for the average consumer who wants to go to an electronic store online, do about 10 minutes worth of research, and get a general indicator of whether or not the display is good enough. Chances are, if you are a professional or an enthusiast, you already have a pretty good idea of the kind of metrics you're looking for for a good display, but as always, if you're interested in a certain aspect of display quality, whether it's panels, color calibration, color accuracy, whatever it might be, let me know in the comment section below. I'd love to take into consideration and potentially make a future video on it. As always, if you found this guide to be helpful, consider subscribing to my channel and liking this video. It really does help me grow and helps me provide more quality content for you awesome folks. Thank you so much for watching. I hope this helps you make the right decision. Catch you in the next one.